HeLa cells stand as the most extensively utilized human cell line in biological research, and it was the reason for numerous groundbreaking medical advancements over nearly seven decades. What if we told you that the story behind these cells is deeply connected with issues of racial inequality? Hela, named after Henrietta Lacks, a poor black woman who tragically passed away from cervical cancer at the young age of 31 in 1951. During one of her medical sessions at Baltimore's Johns Hopkins Hospital, doctors took a sample of her cancerous cells without her knowledge. Henrietta's cancer showed an extraordinarily aggressive nature, with her cell samples doubling in size every 20 to 24 hours, a trait that is rarely seen in other cases. When provided with the right nutrients, these cells never die. In fact, they are still alive and multiplying to this day. Now what makes this story sadder is neither Henrietta nor her family consented to the use of her cells, a step that wasn't commonly practiced or legally required back then, and still isn't in many cases today. Despite the enormous wealth generated by the biotech industry through the use of HALA cells, Henrietta's descendants did not receive any financial compensation and were not even consulted about the various projects involving their ancestors' cells. Seven decades have already passed. What has happened since then? Before we answer that, join us as we take a deeper look into Henrietta's story and let's find out how her cells saved millions, including you. Henrietta Lacks was born on August 1, 1920, in Roanoke, Virginia. After Henrietta Lacks's mother passed away while giving birth to her tenth child, when Henrietta was only four, her father relocated with all ten children to Clover, Virginia. This move brought them closer to their extended family and the lands where their ancestors had worked as slaves. In Clover, Henrietta's father distributed the children among their relatives, Henrietta Lacks grew up with her grandpa Tommy Lacks, who was also raising her cousin David, known as Day. While Day dropped out of school in fourth grade due to poverty, Henrietta continued her studies until the sixth grade. Interestingly, Henrietta Lacks ended up tying the knot with her cousin Day Lacks on April 10, 1941, at the age of 20. At the time, marrying cousins wasn't uncommon, especially in rural areas like where they lived in Virginia. They were then encouraged by their cousins to move to Bethlehem Steel to escape the struggles of being tobacco farmers. Following their marriage, they settled in Turner Station, Maryland, where Day worked for Bethlehem Steel at Sparrows Point. The couple embraced Catholicism and raised five children together. Lawrence, Lucille, David Jr., Deborah, and Joseph. Her daughter Lucille, also called Elsie, had developmental issues at the time. Around 1950, Henrietta Lacks confessed something to her female cousins. It turns out, Henrietta had been experiencing a sensation of a knot inside her abdomen, yet she didn't seek medical help. And just a week after sharing her discomfort, she became pregnant with her fifth child, Joseph. With Joseph on the way, caring for her daughter Elsie became too much for Lacks to manage alone. Doctors advised sending Elsie to the hospital for the Negro Insane, later renamed Crownsville State Hospital in Crownsville, Maryland. In January 1951, Lax, troubled by the persistent knot she felt inside her, along with unusual vaginal bleeding and a lingering lump on her cervix following childbirth, made the decision to seek medical help. Understanding the cervix as the lower part of the uterus connecting to the vagina, Lax turned to the Johns Hopkins Hospital when she felt she had no other recourse. Racial segregation was more prevalent at the time. Johns Hopkins Hospital was one of the few hospitals that were willing to take care of black patients. The hospital has a public ward that caters to poor patients that cannot afford medical fees. Johns Hopkins Hospital, located in Baltimore, Maryland, is a world-renowned medical institution affiliated with Johns Hopkins University. In February 1951, a biopsy revealed the existence of a cervical tumour that had gone unnoticed by doctors during both her son's birth on September 19, 1950, and a subsequent checkup six weeks later. Dr. Howard Jones, a gynaecologist at Johns Hopkins Hospital, performed the biopsy on Henrietta Lacks, and he said that he has never seen a tumour like that. Lacks chose to keep her diagnosis to herself. Whenever she needed to go to the hospital, she would tell her husband that she was going there only for her medication. Lax chose not to share her diagnosis with her family because she wanted to handle it on her own without causing worry to anyone else. Following additional examinations, Henrietta underwent the initial of multiple radium treatments, 
the prevailing medical practice at that time. This procedure involved attaching small glass tubes containing radioactive metal, known as BRAC plaques, to the cervix using fabric pouches. During the treatment, Dr. Jones, without the knowledge of his patient, collected two tissue samples, one from Henrietta's tumor and another from nearby healthy cervical tissue. These samples were sent to Dr. George Gay, pronounced as Gay, who is the head of tissue culture research at Johns Hopkins. Scientists all over the world attempted to grow cells in the lab using various methods. These methods included utilizing animal cells, such as those from mice or rats, or trying to culture human cells from tissues such as skin or organs. However, these attempts are proven to fail because the cells die within hours or a day. This problem was present for many decades that had passed and it ended when Henrietta Lacks's cells were discovered. Dr. George Gay examined the cells and he was surprised to see that these cells only continued to multiply and within a day their number was doubled. Dr. George called his colleagues all over the world and delivered the news of the first immortal cell line. He sent samples to different scientists for free and HeLa cells was quickly known worldwide. This biopsy taken from Henrietta Lacks produced a cell line that would grow essentially forever and was immediately distributed all over the world. While all of these are happening, Henrietta is still suffering from her battle with cervical cancer. In the beginning, a little hope was seen as the radium treatments appeared to work, with doctors noting that the tumor had vanished. But Henrietta's relief was short-lived. As therapy progressed, her condition worsened, her abdomen turning from soft brown to black as coal. Desperate, she lifted her shirt to reveal the spreading darkness to her sisters Sadie and Margaret, a sensation she described as if the blackness be spreading all inside. Despite the efforts, the radium treatments failed to stop Henrietta's cancer's progress. By the fall of 1951, her body was full with tumors, infesting her diaphragm, bladder, cervix, kidneys and lungs, tormenting her with excruciating pain. Her cries echoed through the halls of Johns Hopkins Hospital. Weak and drained, Henrietta's kidneys failed, unable to cleanse her blood of toxins, Transfusions became a routine, but sadly, it is not working for her. Even morphine did not help in lessening the pain. In a last-ditch effort, doctors injected alcohol into her spine, grasping at straws as her suffering persisted. Beside her bed, loved ones are gathered. Their prayers are of desperate pleas for mercy. Among them was Henrietta's sister Gladys, who held her hand as she slipped away. In her final moments, she was able to say the words, Don't you let anything bad happen to them children when I'm gone. Henrietta entrusted her children to Gladys's care, tears falling with whispered promises to protect them. At 12.15 a.m. on October 4, 1951, Henrietta Lacks drew her last breath, succumbing to cancer. Her body is returned to Clover, laid to rest in an unmarked grave beside her mother. Soon after that, the Heller cell line was commercialized, but it was not patented. It was only a matter of time before people in the biomedical industry had already been making millions, but the family was not informed of the discovery, let alone the harvesting of her cells. It is indeed a shame considering all the contributions of Heller's cell line to humanity. Throughout history, Henrietta's cells had been widely used in making various tests and developing cures for well-known diseases and medical conditions. It was used in developing effective vaccines. One major example is the polio vaccine. It was during the early 1950s that researchers discovered that they could cultivate significant quantities of the polio virus in Heller cells. This breakthrough provided valuable knowledge on the virus's mechanisms of cell infection and disease development, ultimately contributing to the development of the polio vaccine, which was later released in the United States in 1955. The cells were also used in further understanding cancer. In 1985, scientists used the HeLa cells to uncover that human papillomavirus, HPV, the most prevalent sexually transmitted infection, can lead to cervical cancer. The primary researcher behind this breakthrough was later awarded the Nobel Prize for laying the foundation for the development of the HPV vaccine. Henrietta's cells were also used for the research of HIV and AIDS. In the late 1980s, scientists found that HIV, the virus responsible for AIDS, encounters difficulties in infecting HeLa cells. This discovery provided crucial insights into the infection's mechanisms and served as a foundation for the development of HIV and AIDS medications. 
Salmonella, a bacterial strain responsible for causing over 1 million infections and more than 25,000 hospitalizations annually in the US, was studied in the 1970s using HeLa cells to understand its mechanisms of infection. This research ultimately contributed to the development of approaches for diagnosing and treating the illness. In 1956, scientists used HeLa cells to investigate the effects of X-ray radiation on cells, revealing its potential harm, and that's why we learned how to be safe in using this technology. And just a few years ago, HeLa cells contributed to COVID-19 research by offering insights into the molecular mechanisms of SARS-CoV-2019 and the necessary components for infection. These findings are crucial pieces of information that contributed to a deeper comprehension of the virus, helping in the development of potential treatments. With this knowledge, we already know that HeLa cells saved millions, possibly more than that. The widespread use of HeLa cells in research has led to the establishment of a multi-billion dollar industry centered around cell culture and biotechnology. HeLa cells were the first human immortal cell lines to be mass-produced for commercial purposes, leading to the development of new drugs, diagnostics, and medical technologies. These cells have been used all over the world by scientists, labs, researchers, and millions, millions of dollars have been made, and you still have the family struggling with basic health care. Yes, you heard that right. Despite the significant profits generated from the use of Henrietta's cells, her family did not receive compensation for their contribution to science. Now, seven decades later, has this situation changed at all? Henrietta Lacks, with her poor and uneducated background, never consented to the use of cells from a biopsy taken before her death for research purposes. For a long time, her family was unaware that her cells were still active in laboratories around the world. It wasn't until recently that they discovered her cells had contributed to the creation of the Heller cell line, which has yielded billions of dollars. In 2013, the National Institute of Health, or NIH, finally reached an agreement with Henrietta Lacks's family. This agreement ensured that Lacks' genome data would only be accessible to those who obtain permission. Additionally, two representatives from the Lacks family would participate in the NIH group overseeing researchers' applications for controlled access to HeLa cells. Researchers using this data would also be required to acknowledge the Lacks family in their publications. Unfortunately, the recent agreement between the NIH and the Lacks family doesn't involve any monetary compensation for the family. Despite that fact, the agreement was still considered a moral and ethical victory for a family that has long been marginalized and excluded from recognition and participation in the genetic research facilitated by HeLa cells. But isn't it interesting that after all these years, the hidden story of Henrietta Lacks has just come to light? Meet Rebecca Skloot, an American science writer and author best known for her book The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Born in 1972, Skloot spent over a decade researching and writing the book, which explores the life of Henrietta Lacks and the impact of her immortal cells, known as Heller cells, on scientific research and medical advancements. Skloot's book not only shares the story of Henrietta Lacks's life and the scientific significance of her cells, but also explores issues of race, ethics, and consent in medical research. It became a bestseller and received widespread critical acclaim for its compelling storytelling and thought-provoking examination of ethical issues. Rebecca Skloot worked with Henrietta Lacks's daughter Deborah in uncovering the truth almost six decades later. As Deborah learned about these things, she was, there was so much, there's so much mixed emotion in it because on the one hand, look at all this incredible stuff my mother did for science and for the world. That, that gave her a level of peace with her mother's death that she wanted her entire life. Um, at the same time, there was a lot of anger about um, the fact that everyone is benefiting from these cells except her family. In addition to that, the Henrietta Lacks Foundation was also established by Rebecca Skloot to honor the legacy of Henrietta Lacks and to support her descendants. Its goal is to provide assistance to the Lacks family, particularly in areas such as healthcare and education. The foundation also seeks to promote ethical practices in biomedical research and to raise awareness about the contributions of Henrietta Lacks to science. Through fundraising efforts and partnerships with various organizations, the foundation works to address the needs of the Lacks family 
and to ensure that they receive recognition and support for Henrietta Lacks' important contribution to medical science. The Foundation also advocates for informed consent and fair treatment of research participants, drawing attention to the ethical considerations surrounding the use of biological samples in scientific research. Because of the efforts of the Foundation and the donations of the good-hearted people, Henrietta Lacks' family was able to support the education of Henrietta's younger descendants. Looking back at the life of Henrietta Lacks, it was truly a sad story. It is a story about race, science and medicine. If we really think about it, so much of the history of science and medicine was built with the use of black people without their knowledge and permission. Which is why it's important to take a moment to appreciate and reflect on the life of Henrietta Lacks. She might not even know it, but her cells helped save millions from experiencing the same pain she experienced. Thank you for staying until the end of the video. If you like this content, please subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any future uploads. Don't forget to like, comment and share. We look forward to seeing you in the next video. When I do speaking engagements, uh, people come up to me and they say, uh, I have children because of your grandmother. Um, that's a heartwarming feeling when, you know, your grandmother has died, but yet she's still providing life. So for her to know that she is saving and impacting so many lives, uh, she would be, she would be smiling from ear to ear. That beautiful smile, that beautiful Henrietta smile, uh, it, 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 it'll light up a room.